I speak these words to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, St. Albans. Good morning. Good morning. Today is the third Sunday after the Epiphany. Epiphany. I think about this. What is that? What is an epiphany? It's a burst of awareness that may come to us as a surprise, a flash of illumination, of seeing clearly those things which were dim or unlit before. Life itself is nothing if not a string of small epiphanies, like you can surf in Maine in January. <laughs> Did you know this? <laughs> Just figuring this out. Who knew? Epiphany. If you don't want to read a whole document or a whole website, you can click Command F and just search for the words you're looking for. <laughs> Epiphany. If you have several unpeeled cloves of garlic and you don't have a lot of time, you can put them in a mason jar with a lid and shake it for about a minute and they come out perfectly peeled. <laughs> Epiphany. Right? But by this, I don't just mean that epiphanies are times when we learn new tips and tricks for life, as helpful as they are. The epiphany in church refers to expanding our awareness of Jesus Christ and of who he is and of what that means for our lives. If you're like me, if you grew up in the church or you've been around a long time, and you've spent Sundays hearing these Bible passages, maybe in the middle of the week also, you've had the occasion to read the Bible. It becomes rarer and rarer to have a major epiphany. You begin getting settled with what you think you know it already means when you hear it. You hear these readings and you start to establish the standard way they function for you. The reasons you use them, the reasons you reference them, and the things they mean to you. And they start to become part of the furniture in the room, and you can forget about the nuance they provide. You know what I'm saying? Um, it's like mayonnaise. You probably have one or two daily uses for mayonnaise at home, right? And you use your mayonnaise the way you use your, man your mayonnaise. And then you stop thinking about all the other things you can do with mayonnaise. <laughs> like a turkey sandwich is great, but you're forgetting about deviled eggs. <laughs> Red pepper aioli. Potato salad. The scripture is this way. I love mayonnaise, as you can probably tell from looking at me. And I don't know why I'm talking about that in the pulpit. <laughs> but I do know that these readings, the gospel and the epistle, are readings that operate like this for me. And I know that there is more there to be explored and uncovered, even though they've become so familiar to me. So familiar. I've always used this Corinthians reading as a way to keep perspective around who should be welcome in the church. The hand, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, right? Everyone must be welcome in the church, or we aren't being the church. No one is expendable. I've read it to mean that a healthy body is a diverse body with many different members, or that it has a lot of complexity, but there is a unity of purpose. So we're different, 
and we're busy, but we're unified in the spirit. We're the body of Christ. But a small epiphany I might be having this time around as I read this is that perhaps I have been too naive or too universal with my view of Christian unity. This year, my new thought was that body parts are physically connected to each other and have a unity of purpose. They serve a common purpose and a common body. A hand cannot say to the foot, I have no need of you, because they're physically connected. So I wonder about our connection. What is it that makes us connected? Paul tells us it's the spirit as we're baptized into the body of Christ. But perhaps the very inclusive nature of this metaphor that I tend to focus on, the inclusivity piece, and I wonder if it might be limited to those who are fulfilling some purpose in the body of Christ. While God intends to include all, perhaps that inclusion actually demands something of us. Like at the very least, perhaps it demands of us an answer to the question, how are our lives connected to the mission of God? How are we members of the body doing the work of God in the world? And if you wonder just what is the mission of God in Christ, you really don't have to look much further than this gospel reading. To preach good news to the poor and release to the captive and recovery of sight to the blind and the liberation of the oppressed. You know, since Jesus is God and since he's saying that this is his purpose, it sort of feels like that's what we're supposed to do if we want to serve God's mission. Because the church really doesn't have a mission outside of God's mission. When you think about it, we only exist to get involved in the support of whatever it is God is up to. And perhaps Luke 4 is a handy summary of that. <coughs> Preaching good news to the poor, release to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind. <laughs> Believing in the gospel is less about putting it all together mentally and more about having trust in our hearts and the fundamental belief that God has got our back. God has got your back. If you are in prison, God is all about setting you free. If you are poor, God wants to bail you out. If you are oppressed, God wants to liberate you. And that's why the mission of the church, our message, is called the good news. Because it's good news. It's not a confusing formula that we have to study and grasp intellectually with leather-bound books from hundreds of years ago. It's pretty simple. It's liberation and life and acceptance. And that's how we know when we've got the gospel, when we have the joy of liberation and life and acceptance from Christ. And when we get it, we get it. And when we get it, we want to give it because it's contagious. This joy of life and liberation and acceptance is contagious. And you want to go out and do what Ezra did in this reading from Nehemiah, reading from the book of the law of Moses, and the people hear it and they are reminded of their sinfulness, of their lawlessness, and they start wailing and weeping. And Ezra's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He 
comes out and says, stop your wailing and weeping. Go your own way. Eat the fat. Drink the sweet wine. For this is a holy day of the Lord, and the joy of the Lord will be your strength. He's what he says to these people in their mourning and their weeping. Do not lose sight of the basic fact that God is on your side. God has your back. And God seeks to build you up, not to tear you down. That's the good news. So, eat the fat and drink the wine. I'm going to get one of those signs, you know, those signs that say, like, live, laugh, love. <laughs> Except I'm going to make it say, eat the fat and drink the wine. And I'm going to pick my <laughs> Because we need a reminder of this. We have, through this pandemic, we have forgotten how to celebrate. Our humanity, our souls are weary. We're weeping and wailing, and we, we're going to have to relearn joy and community and the good news together. Yesterday, I saw a story about a group of moms in Massachusetts. You might have seen this. They all felt the need for a good primal scream. <laughs> Just a good way to release some stress. And so they put it on a local Facebook page and a whole bunch of moms <laughs> showed up at the football, the high school football field in this town in Massachusetts and they just yelled at the sky. <laughs> Doesn't that sound fantastic? <laughs> That's where we are. That's how it feels to be alive in our world right now. And there's so much that needs to come out of us and to be expressed out of us. I know, at least for myself, I have been so angry at times at the world, at my neighbors, at my family members, at my friends, at the government, at the situation, and at all of these reasons for my anger have changed along the way. And I have a new awareness of my own mental health needs, those of my loved ones, and what I must do to maintain my own self-care. And screaming sounds like it could be a great part of that. <laughs> just want to say, if that's you, if that's where you're feeling, you are not alone. This is part of us right now. And maybe you don't feel like talking about religion. You just need to let that primal prayer out. Maybe in the car on the way home. Or maybe you should find a football field. But we can't lose sight of our joy. We have to express the stuff we're feeling, and we have to remember the discipline of celebration. To eat the fat and drink the wine, because we've forgotten. Maybe we should hold a service of screaming at St. Albans. Maybe that's what Ash Wednesday. <laughs> Just let her rip and get our ashes. We have to take care of ourselves. And that starts with honesty. It starts with feeling the things we feel and talking about them and making peace with them. It starts with eating the fat and drinking the wine, finding our joy. Maybe it starts with the courage to reach out and tell somebody you're not okay. That you need to go talk to someone. Or go see a doctor. Make a change. Or maybe if it's on a different level, it just means you need to go try going to the movies again. 
Remember the movies? <laughs> or go to the ocean. We live here. Or go to a restaurant or whatever you need to do safely, of course, but to take care of yourself and to keep in touch with your joy. Don't lose sight of your joy because as Ezra says, and this was my epiphany, the joy of the Lord actually is our strength. And now may that scripture be fulfilled in our hearing today. Amen. Amen. Amen.